Well, what is up, all of our Liberty-loving friends? This is another fantastic episode of Good Morning Liberty. My name is Nate Thurston, and I'm by myself today. You know, Charles had that uh, that accident on Friday, had a wreck on Friday. It was actually a fairly bad one, total his truck, airbags, all that kind of stuff. He's dealing with getting everything out of his truck today since it is a goner and working on getting another vehicle so he can actually leave his house and come to the office. So he was just too busy. It happened on a Friday, and now today's Monday, and he's dealing with all of that. So we will give him, just cut him just a little bit of slack today, just a little bit, but today's the last day. Tomorrow, if for some reason he isn't here, which he says he's going to be here tomorrow, if he's not here tomorrow, the slack cutting is over. Well, anyway, if this is your first time listening, just know that there's normally, I would say like, 75% of the time, 80 even, maybe 80 to 85% of the time, there's another person named Charles Chuck Thompson who's sitting across the desk from me while we're talking. So you don't just have to listen to me talk the entire time, but today it's only me. Maybe go back and listen to one of those episodes where there's two of us or find a dumb bleep of the week. Whatever you do, make sure you hit follow, subscribe, the like button, Whatever all those things are, go do that so you can listen to this episode every single day of the week when we want to. Well, today is a big day of a big week. Today is a big day because uh, we're all talking about recession. I see it trending on Twitter right now. On Thursday, we get our quarter two GDP numbers. Now, historically, typically the definition of a recession is when you have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. In 2022, I think we know that definitions don't really matter, okay? That we don't need to worry about, like, what the dictionary says about something or what we've historically done. And I will give just a little bit of slack, I guess, on the GDP thing and the recession thing because the the National Bureau of Economic Research, they do have to actually declare a recession, and sometimes they'll do it even when we haven't had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Uh, For instance, like the COVID uh, pandemic, they actually declared a recession a lot sooner than that. Are they going to declare recession this week? I don't know. The White House is saying, nope, nope, we're not in a recession. Everyone else is saying, yeah, we probably are. We've been in one for a bit. Let's read a little bit of what the White House had to say on this and some interesting tweets that we've seen so far. Um, This is the, I see Costco posting this in here, and we do have that on the screen as well. So from WH.gov, the blog, what is a recession? While some maintain that two consecutive quarters of falling real GDP constitute a recession. That is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle. Instead, both official determinations of recessions and economists' assessment of economic activity are based on a holistic look at the data, including the labor market, consumer and business spending, industrial production, and incomes. Based on these data, it is unlikely that the decline in GDP in the first quarter of this year, even if followed by another GDP decline in the second quarter, indicates a recession. Oh, whoops. Hold on. I just got an alert. What was that? Okay. I just got an alert on a stock. Hold on. Let me check and make sure what that is. Okay. Anyway, not important. Not important right now. So are we going to be in a recession? Eh, I don't know. It depends on whether or not the White House wants to say we are, apparently. You see, they want to look at, the main thing they want to look at is the jobs data because the unemployment rate is still low right now, still something around like 3.6%. Now, is that jobs data accurate? Is the unemployment data accurate? Does it actually mean anything at all? I don't know. We've been using the unemployment rate for a while now, but we all know that that statistic is ridiculous. If you go a certain amount of time without looking for a job or you decide that you're going to give up looking for a job, then you're not even counted as unemployed anymore. So that's kind of a weird one. But these days, I mean, you can find a job if you want to. There's tons of open jobs out there. I understand what the White House is saying. It's not just the negative GDP and then we're in a recession. If the economy still seems like it's strong for whatever other reason, yeah, you could say that. But When you're going to do a holistic approach, could you also consider other things like, okay, the jobs data 
I guess the unemployment rate's pretty low. I don't know. We spent like five, six trillion dollars uh, in this period of time getting our unemployment rate uh, from the level it was before the pandemic to the level it is right now, which is the about the same level. Uh, so we spent all that money. Credit card spending going through the roof right now. You know, people taking on tons of debt. Uh, real income, real wages declining because inflation has been so hot. So I don't know. If they do actually take a real hol- holistic look at the data, they might find that we're in a, a much worse scenario than what they're going to try to pretend we're in. Let me see if we can play this video from the White House press briefing when they decided they were going to ask, are we in a recession? What did they have to say about that? I mean, so I read the CEA blog. Is the White House trying to change the common definition of a recession because next Thursday the GDP numbers coming out are going to show that we've been in a recession? So let me say this. You know, the strength of our labor market along with the other economic uh, factors is what, what we generally see in a recession or even a pre a – pre, what is not what we generally see in a recession or even a pre-recession because we're seeing the strength of the economy and the labor market. So that's really important uh, to note there, there because those are uh, key elements as we talk about that, as folks keep asking us about that. So Americans across the country are back to work uh, at a historic level. 21 states, the most in history, have unemployed rates, unemployment rates at or below 3%. Uh, that is an important number to note. 14 states uh, are now at their lowest unemployment rates since this series began in 1976. And last month, the unemployment rate was a new low in eight states. So again, the strength of our labor market, along with the economic indicators, is not what we generally see uh, as we talk about uh, recession or even pre-recession. But the growth of the job for the three months trend, the growth of job growth in the U.S. is, is shrinking, is decreasing, and 7.5 million people, a growing number, are, are multi-jobs, meaning they have to work more than one job to afford a living. So is jobs really a good indicator? Oh, look. Here's what I would say. We've always talked about the strength of our economy. We've always start, talked about how historic it's been, and we've always talked about the transitioning, right? The transitioning to more stable uh, and steady growth. And so, to your point about uh, the job growth there, this is what we have been kind of stating for the past uh, several months. Look, you know, the economy created 1.1 million jobs in the second quarter. Uh, and so, and around 375 jobs per month. Those are historic numbers. Uh, those are, if you think about the the 1.1 million jobs, we are back to where we were uh, at pre-pandemic levels. So that is what we see as strength of the economy. I like uh, Amanda pointing out that she's looking down the whole time while she's answering all of this. Uh, good call. You do, you would suspect that the, that they would know that they're going to have questions about this, you know, and kind of have all this a little bit more rehearsed, kind of actually know the numbers before going in instead just reading these lines off of a piece of paper. Of course, they knew that they were going to get asked about this and they want to start saying, now this probably means that we are going to get the negative GDP numbers because they're coming out in front of this and saying this is not a recession. So just in case anyone's wondering, probably going to get that negative Q2 GDP number here at the end. And then she, uh, she ends up saying that, well, the strength of our jobs, we created 1.1 million jobs in the second quarter, and we're back to the numbers that we had pre-pandemic. You know what? I know that we're, we're just about back to the numbers that we had pre-pandemic. It also took several trillion dollars of printing and taxing to get back to a number that we had before governments across the country shut things down and before we killed our entire economy. So not exactly as if we're on the same footing as we were before that pandemic, because it took all of this money, this fake money, to get us back to that scenario. Um, I like a few of the comments that I've seen from people on this, like uh, Cassandra BC. Now, this is Michael Burry. Big Short Burry, as I call him around my house. He says the White House would like you to redefine a recession as one in which consumers are not borrowing on credit cards to pay for inflation, and neither is the labor force inadequate for the size of the economy. GDP out Thursday, not that there's anything wrong with that. So he talks about, okay, spending. They look at consumer spending. 
Yeah, a lot of it is on credit cards right now. I brought in some of the data on this just to go over some of the credit card data. Um, this is These are the consumer loans. This is from the FRED. The consumer loans, credit cards, and other revolving plans. Now, we dipped down the $738 billion, uh, during the COVID crash, and we've popped back up to an all-time high of $887 billion. Uh, almost $150 billion in credit card debt added on in a very short amount of time. And another thing I have notated down here at the bottom is that the amount of growth we've had in this debt, this, uh, this exceeds the yearly growth of any of these previous, previous years that we've had. And this is per year down here at the bottom. We've exceeded the amount per year uh, that, that we have had in at least the last 10 years, which is what I'm showing right now. So that's not exactly a good thing. A consumer spending is strong. Is it with actual money that the consumers have, or are they having to take out a bunch of credit cards so they can spend money on things that they might not exactly need, but uh, uh, whatever, they're spending money on things. So I don't know. Uh, We've got a little bit more data right here. You know, they're talking about jobs. This is the labor force participation rate. Now, when you look at the unemployment rate, you'll see that we're all the way back down to where we were before the pandemic. We're way down here in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. We're all the way back to where we were before the pandemic happened. When you look at the labor force participation rate, uh, we have not made it back up to the peak before the pandemic. We're still a pretty good amount lower than that right now. Now, that's not a massive amount. This thing fluctuates between like 62 and 64 over the last 10 years or so. And we're at the bottom range of that. We have not made it back up to the point that we were at before the pandemic. So while the unemployment rate might look pretty good, the actual labor force participation rate has not made it back up to where we were before the pandemic. And that's, that's with all of the crazy amounts of spending that we've done so far. So I think that that is a lot, a lot better. And speaking of, uh, let's look at some other, you can see. So Peter Schiff, he says, according to Secretary Yellen, regardless of how many quarters the GDP falls, an economy creating 400,000 jobs per month is, isn't in a recession. What if those are second or third jobs for people struggling to pay bills or retirees going back to work as inflation destroyed their incomes? And that is, in fact, a lot of what you're seeing. A lot of retirees going back to work because their retirement money is not enough to live off of anymore, or it's people getting second and third jobs. That's the job uh, creation, the amount of jobs added, the amount of jobs taken by people. Uh, That could be second or third jobs or retirees going back because the inflation has destroyed their income. So once again, the, uh, the, the money, the actual... The actual money that we put into this is ridiculous. We're not back to where we were. And the jobs numbers do not tell you everything. And the fact that we've added all of these jobs, that might not necessarily be a good thing with the labor force participation rate still being much lower and a lot of retirees deciding to go back to work. Uh, yeah, we're pretty much in a recession. Yeah, T-Dub's right. What we need here are more STEMI checks. Just send us some more money. That would be great. How about we just get some more money? That'll solve that'll solve the problem, actually, if they do that. So that's where we are with the recession. I talked to everyone in the class earlier this morning in the trading class. I actually think that if we do get the numbers saying that we're in a recession and they do declare a recession, someone walks out of the office and they say, I declare we're in a recession. I actually think that'll end up being pretty bullish for the market because the Fed doesn't typically raise rates really heavily into a recession. Typically, they're lowering rates during a recession. So I think we could end up taking that as a bullish scenario for the market. Anyway, you'd have to be in the class to be hearing me say that kind of stuff every single morning. Now, we got an email from one of our listeners who said we should talk about this whole Dutch farmer protest thing. And I also got an email from the New York Times this morning explaining to me what happened in Sri Lanka. And so I got those two things. And I also saw a story over the weekend about Kylie Jenner taking a private flight for 17 minutes to get from one place pretty close to another, taking a private flight. And the Boston Globe did this big write-up on it. And I also saw Al Gore coming out there making ridiculous comparisons to climate deniers and 
other stuff, which we'll talk about here in a sec. We'll, uh, we'll listen to the video from him. So I thought, hey, maybe it's a good time to talk about this whole climate change thing. So this has been going on for a bit. But uh, as you all have seen uh, around on the Twitter sphere, because you are far right extremists, as we will hear from Salon here in a bit, you've probably seen that there are farmers protesting some of the new rules over there in the Netherlands where they are essentially deciding that they're going to put a lot of small farmers out of business to stop the climate from changing just a little bit. And it's definitely going to work. It's, it's for sure going to work. Whether or not it works, that's less important than showing that you're doing something. That's what's really important these days. Are you doing something to say that you are stopping this? Yes. Okay, well, then you're a good person. From ABC News right here, they're saying, why are Dutch farmers protesting over emissions? If you haven't heard much about it, here's some of what's going on. The farmers protested around the Netherlands as lawmakers voted Tuesday. Now, this is from a couple weeks ago on proposals to slash emissions of damaging pollutants, a plan that will likely force farmers to cut their livestock herds or stop work altogether. The government says emissions of nitrogen oxide and ammonia which livestock produce, must be drastically reduced close to nature areas that are part of a network of protected habitats for endangered plants and wildlife stretching across the 27-nation European Union. The ruling coalition, which is their really they're not talking about the World Economic Forum here, of course, they're talking about their ruling coalition there. They want to cut emissions of pollutants Predominantly nitrogen oxide and ammonia by 50% nationwide by 2030. Ministers are calling the proposal an unavoidable transition. There's nothing they can do about it. That aids to improve air, land, and water quality. They warn that farmers will have to adapt or face the prospect of shuttering their businesses. Quote, the honest message is that not all farmers can continue their business. You know who will be able to continue their business and who's going to be helped a lot by this? The really big industrial farms. The really Those ones that everyone is supposed to hate, that everyone on the left hates, and they want to push us to smaller farms, more organic farms, and your farmer's markets, and your family farms, and all that. And, and of course, these big monopolistic farm companies have been putting all of our farmers out of business. Well, those are the people that we want to help right now, because guess what? They can do things more efficiently, and that's going to be better for the environment, and we're all going to die because of the temperature, so we have to do this. we got to put all the small, far small farmers out of business. For those of you who don't know, I actually come from a farm family. You might hear me sometimes mention a couple things about how I grew up. You could hear me say that I grew up in a trailer park, or you could hear me say that I grew up on a farm. And that's because those are both true. I have a bit of a unique upbringing because my parents divorced when I was really young, uh, when I was three years old, and I split time between my mom and my dad. Uh, my mom had no job, no college education, nothing like that. When they got divorced, I had to go with her to class. Uh, she ended up becoming a school teacher at the school that I was going to. Times were not the easiest when we were growing up. And at my dad's, they're a farm, farm family. For like over a hundred years, they've been farming this land in Illinois. And my dad really wishes he could pick up a lot of acres and move them to Tennessee. But unfortunately, that's, uh, we don't have the technology. Um, so I do kind of have a little bit of background on the whole farming thing. And so that's why I can talk about these farmer protests. And if this is ever necessary, I will go up there and I will, I will grab a tractor myself in Illinois and drive to whatever the protest is. You guys just uh, let me know. So let's keep going. It's not only farmers being targeted. In the past, the government has also cut the national maximum speed limit on highways from 130 kilometers per hour to 100 kilometers per hour during the day as a way of reducing nitrogen oxide created by vehicle engines. Now, I need to see the data on this. I'm, I'm not claiming that they didn't go all the way through the data, but I'm assuming because they're very, very smart uh, very, very uh, smart people that look at all the data that they took into account the fact that if you drive slower, you're going to spend a longer time in your vehicle driving to whatever the place is. I am, I'm assuming that they looked at that, that if you add 10 minutes onto someone's trip, that their car would be running when otherwise, if they were going faster, their car wouldn't be running during that time. 
I'm, I'm just assuming that they did look through all of that data, but I do not know yet. I haven't looked at it. We'll see. Okay, so down the article here, they say, how important is agriculture to the Dutch economy? Agriculture, from dairy farming to growing crops in fields and greenhouses, is a significant part. According to the National Farming Lobby Group, there are nearly 54,000 agricultural businesses in the Netherlands with exports totaling 94.5 billion euros in 2019. So it's pretty important. All right. We're going to go through another, uh, a couple pieces of some articles I read today on this. This is from The Guardian. Emotion and pain as Dutch farmers fight back against huge cuts to livestock. Let's see what was important through here. Now, that remember, they're making these big cuts for people. It's going to hurt a lot of farmers, mostly small, actually all small farmers. Uh, those are the people that it's going to hurt. Well, according to documents released on Wednesday as a result of the MP questions, finance ministry calculations suggest more than half of livestock farmers will have to stop or slim down. The government plans will affect five times more farmers than is strictly necessary. So they're going uh, above and beyond for the climate here, above and beyond hurting farmers there in the Netherlands. There's definitely no cabal of uh, real heavyweights behind all this, pushing this whole thing, right? I mean, that's all a crazy conspiracy theory. That's a, You probably just heard that from Tucker Carlson, I bet. We'll talk to uh, Salon about that here in a second. The LTO Farming Union has refused to interact with the new negotiator, saying the timeline is impossible and too focused on agriculture. Quote, a country-level reduction of 50% in 2030 is simply unfeasible and will have disastrous effects on not just agriculture, but the economic, social, and cultural viability of rural Netherlands. Now, why is it that I decided to bring in Sri Lanka into this here in just a bit? Just keep that little quote there in mind, that it will have disastrous effects on the economic, social, and cultural viability of the Netherlands. There was an interesting article here from the National Interest talking about what we should do in the U.S. if we're going to do anything, because there are big protests over there. What would happen in the U.S. if they decided to do this? What should Congress do if uh, we decide to bend to the will of whoever it is pulling the strings on this whole thing? Climate solutions, what Congress can learn from the Dutch farmer protest. So these new regulations could have serious consequences for the agricultural sector and for their entire economy, by the way. Small family-owned farms, which represent a majority of the farms, do not have the means to change their farming methods like the larger farms do. Mandating these emissions cuts will disproportionately hurt private farmers and could cut into budgets and profits by potentially forcing farmers to limit their livestock production. The agricultural sector in the Netherlands contributed almost $16 billion to the nation's economy in 2021 and was the second largest food exporter in the world in 2020. I repeat, we are talking about what was the second largest food exporter in the world in 2020. So is this going to end up affecting you? You, listener, listening right now, likely in the United States. Regulations that reduce food supplies will push up costs on households and add to the decades high inflation, which has already stalled climate progress. While the environmental and agricultural merits of precision agriculture are, are clear, so in this they t- they start talking about what we could push people to do, or what we could what we could incentivize. How could we do this through the market? Let's say it's important to cut your emissions. Let's just argue from that standpoint. It would be important if. Uh, we could cut our emissions, that it is a worthwhile goal to cut emissions down, which we've naturally been trending towards anyway as we get more and more efficient. They start talking about all of the, um, all of the precision agriculture. Uh, the, fin- the financial strain of purchasing new equipment can deter private property owners, making immediate expensing a permanent fixture in the tax code would allow farmers to deduct the cost of the newer, more efficient technology immediately. Now, I put this in here because I remember strongly a period of time when I was growing up when my dad and uh, my grandpa were expanding the farm rapidly. They were buying new equipment. They were buying new land. They were getting all this, uh, this nice stuff, making everything more efficient. And when I look back at that, why was it that they were doing that? 
Well, they were doing that because we went through a period of a few years there where you could deduct the entire expense of your equipment against your taxes. And essentially, if you bought new equipment, you'd end up not owing taxes that year. Well, now we've gone back away from that. or We're going back away. There was actually a part in the, in the Trump tax cuts that allowed for that immediate expensing. Instead, what we're going to go back to is put, pushing this off where you can do portions of it each year. You can deduct it from your taxes. But the problem is that a dollar tomorrow is worth less than a dollar today. It would be better to actually expense all of that right now, and that would actually incentivize people to move over to more efficient stuff. But the government does there's nothing about actually doing this naturally in a good economic fashion. That is just a crazy right-wing climate denier, someone who does not care about climate change, and you probably want to kill LGBTQ plus babies whenever you talk about that. That's all I hear when you talk about wanting to do this in like a nice natural fashion that doesn't destroy the economy. It, you know, you actually just want to do this in a natural fat fascist. That's really all you're fascist. That's what it is. Fascism when you want to do that. So let's go to Salon. Now, leading up to the Salon article. So we see all this stuff going on in the Netherlands. They're upset about it because literally the government is instituting rules that are going to put them out of business like this year. Like they're like they're done. I mean, seriously, half of them are gone. And the rest of them are going to be making so little money that they're going to go out of business soon. All that's going to be left are the really big conglomerates of massive corporation farms coming in there. The people that I thought, I thought that's who we were supposed to not like. I thought we were supposed to move away from that. I thought we were supposed to move to smaller farms. That's, it doesn't seem to be what's happening right now. It seems like we're going to be moving towards all this big money. It's almost like, um... It's almost like that's more so what the policies of the far left end up pushing us towards. But I don't know. But according to Salon, you know, why, why are we doing this? If you were to ask one of us why we're doing this, it's because, I don't know, World Economic Forum, all this, all this crazy climate change nonsense that's going on, controlling all of these nations, the Great Reset is happening trying to reset the entire world. Well, you only think all of that because you're a crazy far right wing extremist conspiracy theorist. And I'm, I'm sure that you didn't know that, but that's actually why you think all of those things. So we'll go through a little bit of Salon's article here. The far right's latest cause, manure flinging Dutch farmers and the great reset. That's, that's, that's what it is. Half a year after it went all in for the Canadian trucker convoy protesting COVID-19 vaccine mandates, the American right has adopted a new international cause. Dutch farmers who are demonstrating against environmental regulations by parading tractors down highways, lining roads with burning hay bales, blocking food distribution centers, international borders and airports, and spraying liquid manure on government buildings. I actually would like to see a video of someone spraying shit all over a building. That sounds, uh, sounds pretty fun. I'm sure I can find that on YouTube. There's a real and significant issue playing out in the Netherlands below the U.S. right-wing outrage cycle. Since late June, Dutch farmers have been holding large-scale demonstrations to protest new plans to radically reduce the amount of nitrogen oxide and ammonia emissions. In 2019, Holland's highest administrative court ruled that the country's efforts to reduce nitrogen pollution were failing to meet the conditions of the European Union environmental law. The ruling led to the suspension of thousands of new construction projects, including the building of sorely needed new housing and slower speed limits on Dutch highways, as well as plans to reduce the size of Holland's agricultural industry. They're just trying to get out ahead of this whole thing. For years, Dutch politicians have debated how to address the issue, and in June, Netherlands recently appointed Minister for Nature and Nitrogen Policy announced new restrictions. So they're going to cut them in half by 2030, right? But that's going to be really bad for those family-run farms in a country where agriculture is closely tied to national identity with family farms dating back generations. It's an undeniable blow. Holland's government called the plans unavoidable, this unavoidable transition not a reset, it's a transition, by the way. Stop calling it reset. That would force farmers to force farmers to become more sustainable, relocate, or stop. 
let's go out of business and and sell your farm to whoever will buy it from you, probably the government. Okay, this is going to have enormous consequences, says the Dutch Prime Minister. I understand that, and it's simply terrible. I wish there was something we could do, guys. I really wish there was something we could do. All of this is complicated enough on its own. We're still in the Salon article right now about the far right and their conspiracy theorists. A seemingly zero-sum situation in which some farmers are almost certain to lose their livelihoods. Definitely certain, not almost certain. But as the farmer's cause has been adopted by the far right, both in the Netherlands and abroad, it's grown into something larger and uglier. According to those narratives, the new regulations are part of a globalist great reset. Intent on imposing liberal authoritarianism across the world. That's what it is right there. Now, that's a complete conspiracy. There's not even, it's, it's not like there's like a book called The Great Reset or anything like that. Uh, this is just a crazy conspiracy theory. Liberal authoritarianism across the world. It's not authoritarianism. You just have to do exactly what they tell you to do. And it's not like people even voted on it. It's just people in these administrations and the bureaucracies making these decisions. And they make a decision that could destroy your entire livelihood and you have to do it or they're going to put you uh, in prison. It doesn't sound like authoritarianism at all, this, these crazy conspiracy theorists. Jeez. Global elites in this view are orchestrating a food crisis in order to subdue unruly populations and Dutch farmers will be displaced to make room for new immigrants in a literal recapitulation of the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory shared by European and American white supremacists. Now, when it comes to the making room for new immigrants part of the theory, I think we could probably chill on that if you're listening from the Netherlands. That is not helpful. That's not... You You can make this argu argument on purely economic grounds, purely self-ownership and economic grounds. You don't have to go to, oh, they're doing this to make room for the new immigrants. They want to get our land. That's what it is. Maybe that is part of it. I'm just saying it's not, it's not helpful. In an interview with the Epic Times this week, or is it Epoch? I don't know. Who knows? Baudet charged, the people governing this country are following the script written by the EU to realize what they call a great reset. It's a reference to a slogan originally used by the World, World Economic Forum to call for creating. Now, this whole great reset thing, it's not that bad. It's just the World Eco Economic Forum. What they want to do is create a more equitable post-pandemic global economy. What's wrong with that? Do you not want a more equitable, equitable, why can't I say that word? Equitable post-pandemic global economy? What could be wrong with that? Huh. But almost immediately on the right, the term was adopted to refer to a conspiracy theory that globalist elites are using crises like the pandemic as pretext to radically reinvent society along authoritarian one-world government lines. Now, they're not, it's not globalist elites using the pandemic to radically reinvent society along authoritarian one-world government lines. They just want to create a more equitable post-pandemic global economy that you have to do, you have to follow the rules, or they'll put you in prison. That is completely different from them using the pandemic to radically reinvent society along authoritarian lines. See, those, those two things are nothing like one another, as you can tell from the tone of my voice. But the story also became a broader phenomenon across a wide swath of the U.S. right-wing media. Newsweek and Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk cast the protest as a popular uprising and a historic example of worker-centered revolts. This is a worker-centered revolt, isn't it? I guess it's just the wrong workers. It, it is always really weird that when workers uh, rise up against the government, then those are crazy conspiracy theorists, domestic terrorists, loony people. But like when the workers rise up and they try to take over like a corporation or something, then that's completely fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's totally fine. But when the workers rise up against the government who actually has the use of force over those workers who can force them to do their bidding, well, that's wrong. That's a bad thing, of course. 
Right-wing anti-abortion news outlet LifeSite News launched a petition to gather support for the fight back against not just environmental regulations and the resulting inflation, but also the elite's Great Reset agenda. Yes, that is from the right-wing anti-abortion news outlet LifeSite News. LifeSite News. I mean, that's a pretty fair, pretty fair description, I think. One shared consequence of this, though, is that it's become an incredibly aggressive discussion with a huge potential for violence. That's right. We're going to have to quell these worker uprisings against the government because, of course, they're going to become violent and we can't have violent protests against uh, the government. We just can't have that. In 2020, the country's National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism published a threat assessment warning that the farmer protest movement was uniting groups with different grievances but shared antipathy to government, whose alliance could represent a troubling pathway towards radicalization. The radical, radical notion that the government should not be able to come onto your land and shut down your farm because some people in a building somewhere hundreds to thousands of miles away have decided that that is what you should do. Very, 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 very big problem with these people becoming radicalized towards that notion that they should be able to decide what happens uh, on their own farm, as you can understand. Last August, a Dutch newspaper published an investigation tracking the movement's main social media hubs, finding that farm protest pages were increasingly dominated by other concerns, pandemic skepticism, fake vaccine certificates, QAnon-like fixations on pedophile networks, or public riots, and talk of the Great Reset. All of those things working together with the farmer uprising, those QAnon-like fixations on pedophile networks, probably was a bunch of people uh, saying that Epstein didn't kill himself and that we should be able to know who Ghislaine Maxwell's uh, clients were, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. So as you can tell, this is very dangerous stuff that they're going to have to work on this counterterrorism unit. Of course, quote, what we've been seeing in the last few years is the transnational nature of the white supremacist and far right extremist movements said Wendy Villa, co-founder and CEO of the global project against hate and extremism. In April, she testified before the Canadian House of Commons about the pattern of cross-border activism that surrounded last winter's trucker convoys and how conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement have become unifying concepts for white supremacists worldwide. Worldwide. All of you crazy white supremacist farmers who don't want your farm and your livelihood to be taken away by the government, uh, they're coming for you, of course. You know, as they should. I mean, what else? What would you expect? Staying on climate change here for a minute, then we're going to move to uh, some of the similarities with Sri Lanka. What did Al Gore say over the weekend? Well, he's talking about climate change. As you guys know, it's been hot, okay? And so we're hearing from Al Gore a little bit. You know him. He's the guy who's right about everything. So you should pay attention to everything that he has to say because one thing we know about Al Gore is that he's never been wrong. Okay, so let's hear what Al Gore had to say. Let me find this video real fast. It's pretty ridiculous, and we will have to play it on Dumb Bleep of the Week. It's uh, it's just going to have to happen. Uh, But I did want to play it today as well. And majority in the House. You know, the climate deniers uh, uh, are really in some ways similar to all of those uh, almost 400 law enforcement officers in Uvalde, Texas, who were waiting outside an unlocked door uh, while the children were being massacred. They heard the screams, they heard the gunshots, and uh, nobody stepped forward. And God bless those families who've suffered so much. And law enforcement officials tell us that's not typical of what uh, law enforcement usually does. And confronted with this global emergency, what we're doing with our inaction and failing to walk through the door and stop the killing uh, is not typical of what we are capable of as human beings. Yep. 
Yep, yep, that's right. You heard it right. Um, just like the uh, the officers in Uvalde, Texas, who stood outside the door for seventy seven minutes uh, while they uh, while someone was in there killing the kids. Basically, the same thing. Essentially, the same thing. Um, that's disturbing to say the least, and a really stupid analogy. What is it about people on the left being so bad at analogies? Can someone help me work this out? What do you? What qualities do you need to have to be able to make a good analogy with something? I guess you need to have some type of unifying principle, maybe some uh, objectivity, a little bit of objectivism, something like that, uh, to be able to make this. So, so let's just make this analogy right here. So the, there's a there's a kid in a room killing other kids. There's a guy in a room killing kids, and there's officers standing outside the door. Uh, with shields and vests and their own rifles and everything, and they, they're they outside the door for like over an hour. They just let this thing go on. And so that is just like you and me, us right here. We are clearly being confronted with a threat, and we're refusing to take any action to stop that threat. I guess you could say the analogy makes sense if you truly believed all of the climate change nonsense that we're constantly hearing that we're all about to die pretty soon. And there's nothing we can do about it, but we have to destroy our economy anyway. Uh, And that um, all the things that the governments want to do, that that's actually going to solve the problem, that that's going to fix it. Because if you looked at it in the way that it actually is, where there's a threat. I think the climate is changing could potentially be because of human action. I would say the human action doesn't help the climate get any better right now. By the way, it sounds like there's a pretty decent storm going on outside. I just saw the power flicker just a little bit. So if we do lose it, I apologize. We'll see. I just saw some lights flicker. So And so in that analogy, you'd have to believe that all those things are true. But if you know that, okay, there's some human action that's causing this, uh, we don't know exactly. Some of the, some of the numbers and statistics that we see are just totally blown out of proportion. Uh, They're not compared to other numbers that would also be useful. And all the things that they say they're going to do to solve the problem, well, those things aren't actually going to solve the problem. And they're not going to be possible to institute in the first place. And if they did get instituted, they wouldn't actually solve the current problem that we have. Yeah, I don't know. The analogy checks out. Kind of seems like all of that uh, makes total sense. Now, he goes, uh, he goes on. Uh, this article here that was talking about this is from NBC News. They say climate emergencies are unfolding in most parts of the world. Areas in North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia are sweltering under extreme heat with record-breaking temperatures, baking regions of the world already grappling with wildfires and severe drought. Nearly 2,000 have already been killed in this heat wave in Spain and Portugal. That's a lot of people, right? I don't don't like that many people being killed at all. But if we're going to talk about extreme temperatures killing people, Seems like we need to deal with this whole cold problem because, man, cold kills a lot more people than hot. (laughs) Let's just say it that way. The cold is far more dangerous. How much more dangerous is it? Well, this comes from The Lancet. This article comes from The Lancet. I posted it out on the Twitter machine earlier. So the average annual excess deaths due to non-optimal temperatures, they say, Globally, the excess deaths, they say, are 5.08 million. So 5,083,000 are the overall numbers. Now, how many of those are cold-related and how many are heat-related? Well, they've got this number also. Of the 5 million, 4.6 million of those are because of cold. Yeah, 4.6 million. A little bit under 4.6. And about 0.49 million of those are from heat. So 
why is it that we only hear about the heat anytime that there is a heat wave and people die? It seems like we need to get a handle on this whole cold-related deaths thing. And most all of this has to do, by the way, with people not having adequate housing, air conditioning going out. I mean, man, my house, my house got up to 90 degrees inside my house last week when my air went out. Now, if I was old and I was having to live in that house and I didn't have the means to just go stay in a hotel while we were waiting on that to get fixed and I had to stay in that house, well, yeah, that, could, that can cause a problem. So most of that's an economic problem that could be solved easily by being able to have air conditioning fixed earlier, being able to go stay somewhere else. Cold related, better insulation, better heat, all that stuff. That kills way more people. And these are two things that we could easily adapt and fix. But instead, we're going to try to destroy our economy, the entire global economy, because energy is pretty darn important uh, based on crazy stuff like this. It's starting to get a little frustrating. And by the way, I'm back. I'm a little over halfway through another book right now uh, called Apocalypse Never by Michael Schellenberger. And uh, it's really good. I would highly, highly recommend it. And it's always interesting to listen to one of these books, by the way, from the point of view of someone who was on the left. He was like a communist, basically, you know, having birthday parties that were raising money to save the rainforest when he was a kid. And then writing books called Apocalypse Never, taking down all this climate change stuff. That's really refreshing to hear from someone like that because you know you're not getting a whole lot of bias from anyone. Uh, So anyway, here's that uh, spreadsheet once again. Some of these links will be in the show notes. Now, what about this email I got about Sri Lanka? We'll just go over this real quick because we're talking about the Netherlands. We're talking about them having to cut 50% of their emissions bunch of the farmers are going to go out of business. Big bulk of them. They happen to be uh, like the number two exporter of our food, you know, like our meats, got our cows and stuff. A lot of cows over there. Tell you what, there's a whole bunch of them. That's not going to affect anything, right? They're going to be totally fine. Their economy is going to be totally fine. They're not going to go into a recession or a depression or have any kind of major protest or anyone going through a tough time. And even if they do, they'll just they print some more money. Totally fine. They can print more money and they'll be totally fine. Well, I got this email from the New York Times this morning. Today, we explain what led to Sri Lanka's recent protests. So when this article slash email that they sent out, uh, he is uh, the New York Times journalist is interviewing another journalist who's been covering the Sri Lanka protests. And he's asking questions, asking this, uh, this girl questions. What led Sri Lanka to this point? For the past six months, economic conditions for everyday Sri Lankans have grown increasingly difficult. Things like fuel and cooking gas became increasingly expensive and hard to find, and inflation soared. New government import bans meant goods from overseas like chocolate and coffee beans disappeared. In Sri Lanka, there's a sizable middle class. People are not used to scarcity, so they noticed immediately when things started disappearing from the shelves. People were upset about that. And the ability to carry on became all but impossible in the last month or so. Now, that is, to, that is the extent to which this article goes into explaining what happened in Sri Lanka. I also read an article from, from Fee earlier where they talked about there was an hour-long podcast, I believe an hour-long podcast on the New York Times podcast, whatever it's called, where they talked about Sri Lanka. And they did not mention this one little thing, the one little bitty thing, just a little, a little piece of it banning fertilizer and the fact that a massive part of their economy is agriculture, like up to 90% are either farming or uh, are in jobs connected to farming and they banned fertilizer and they killed all their crops. Not mentioned in the discussion of what happened in Sri Lanka. So we are, what we're going to do now is we're going to memory hole what actually happened here. We are going to ignore what actually caused the economic downturn in Sri Lanka, what led to their protests, what led to them going, oh, by the way, the presidential palace, really funny part of this article. Uh, He asked the question, he says, I can't help but compare this to the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. This seemed much more peaceful. The one in Sri Lanka was much more peaceful than the one on January 6th, of course. As you can tell, Uh, From all the stuff, you know, all the people swimming in the pools, running through the Capitol. Uh, The president has to 
flee and jump on a boat and flee the country. Very, very peaceful protests. It mostly, at least, peaceful. Uh, this person answers, says, yeah, I couldn't help thinking of that either. There were several differences. For one, here's what was different with the one in Sri Lanka. For one, these people were not armed. These people in Sri Lanka were not armed. Were the, can someone find me a, a picture of the armed people in the capital? Anyone? Does anyone have any of that? Maybe I missed it. Maybe I completely missed the armed insurrection. Now, I know on the day of the insurrection, we kept hearing about the armed insurrection and even people with guns and all kinds of stuff. And then we go back through it. We can't find anyone that was armed unless they're talking about people with flagpoles or fire extinguishers, which I don't think they brought themselves. They used the ones that were uh, in the room. So um, if you're counting the flagpoles and the fire extinguishers, I'm pretty sure they were at least equally armed. Yeah, the Capitol Police were armed. That's right. Just tell uh, poor, what's your name, Ashley Babbitt. Is that right? But the big difference between the two was that these protesters have have widespread support. Ordinary Sri Lankans were applauding them and even participating. People who would otherwise never be involved in activism or protests were happily wandering around the properties, enjoying themselves and basking in the success of this movement. So that has to do with the amount of people that supported it, of course. I mean, I don't know about the, you know, 70 some odd people, million people who voted for Trump, how much they supported January 6th. Uh, We clearly didn't support it because we knew what the backlash was going to be. If you're going to do something, then do it. Don't just go throw a fit because now you ruin the party for the rest of us. Okay. One guy was horned. You're right about that, T-Dub. Those, it's, it's dangerous, dangerous weapon, of course. And so that's some of the ridiculous stuff that we're seeing right now when it comes to the Netherlands and then Sri Lanka, which is getting memory hold. Just, oh, this nice, peaceful protest that occurred because the government uh, had trouble with some imports like coffee beans. And, uh, and so people just, they're massive uprising in the whole country. What are you going to do? You know, no, it's all the same agenda. It's all the same thing. They decided that they were going to cut fertilizer out of the system, which destroyed all the farms, which destroyed their economy. Now the Netherlands is going to put all these farmers out of business, uh, which is going to really, really hurt their economy. And we'll see what happens and we'll see how much this affects us and whether or not this makes it over to us. I know the same thing would happen here in the United States. Uh, because a lot of the farms, at least the ones that I know of, would have a tough time cutting all of their emissions down by 50% or more immediately without just going out of business. 